Yeah, um, yeah, thank you and welcome to our session for this afternoon. Um, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Miriam Gay Bautista. I'm a PhD student at the University of Technology, Sydney. At the same time, I'm the chair of the Filipinas in Computing, which is a sister community under anitabi.org. Um, yeah, some few house rules before we start our session today. So in just in case of emergency, we have our exit door at your left side. And um, please have your mobile phone in a silent mode or turn it off, just not to distract our speaker for this afternoon. And if you have any question, please feel free to reach to our speaker at the end of her session. Okay, um, so our session for this afternoon is titled Fast Track Your Career Progression by Speaking. So they said there are two reasons why we choose not to speak. First is our fear of speaking in front of the crowd who's having fear. And second is we don't know what to say at all. <laughs> right? So please help me welcome. We have our speaker this afternoon to help us navigate this and address this issue. Um, allow me to introduce our lovely speaker for this afternoon. She has a career in technology spanning 15 years and, now, um, and is now the direct Director of Integration and DevOps. DevOps at the Australian Bureau of Statistics, from developer to sysop, through support and DevOps struggler, her journey has been very transformational. Please help me welcome Vanessa Love. Thank you so much. I have trouble getting that sentence out too, so that's okay. Um, just. Uh, it's not a warning, it's more of a, a statement. Um, I have food poisoning. So I'm probably at about like 10% of my normal energy. And if you go out of this thing and think that was a lot of energy, I'm still at probably about 10%. So today I am here to talk about how you can fast track your career progression by speaking. And generally I mean speaking in front of an audience, speaking in tech communities, speaking at meetups, those kind of things, obviously you are speaking every day and we'll talk a little bit about that too. So I'll talk a little bit about myself. Um, I am a director of DevOps. Now, I had this picture drawn up for one of my presentations because I pretty much sell something that you can't buy, which is DevOps. And so, you know, a shady character trying to sell you some DevOps, it's a little thing I had drawn up. Um, and I'm also a gardener and that's also something that I've spoken about. Um, but one of the other things I am is a speaker. So last year I spoke at nine different events um, over the course of the year. And it's not a full-time job for me. My full-time job is I'm a director at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So um, I spoke at nine different events over the year on various topics from DevOps uh, to AI to speaking. So again, I'm speaking about speaking. It's something I do. Um, but a few other things about me. So I am a cisgendered woman. Um, I am, I turned 40 this year, feeling really good about that, so, yeah, <laughs> we like that number, it's a good number. Um, I'm also bisexual, and I speak in front of crowds, and this is like another one of those self-identifying things, like I'm a fat woman, and that's okay too, but what it means is, I just want, if you know, identify with any of that, just know that that was spoken about in one of the other sessions today where they try and pigeonhole women to be same or that we're all this idea in tech that women are the same, but we are all different. So you might have identified with some of what I said, you might have identified with all of what I said, or none of what I said, and that's okay. So let's talk a little bit about my career and how long it took to sort of get to different levels of leadership during my career. So a while ago, I was a programmer. And you can tell it was a while ago because we called ourselves programmers and not developers. <laughs> so for a while, I was a programmer at a small company. And over that time, probably took, you know, about two years, I became the team lead. And in that time, you know, it was pretty slow, a couple of years became team lead. Um, I would do things like hire men under me who would then question the software I wrote. So that was a pretty fun experience for me. Um, and then I was the head of development at this organization, but it took seven years to sort of make that career progress. It was a very small company and there was just nowhere to go. I also got a little bit sick of having to sort of start conversations with 
how my technical skills were before we got to the meat of things. Um, I always want to think that the industry has changed, but I know the industry hasn't changed that much. Um, so I took a little bit of a sidetrack in my career and I, I sort of moved on and I spent four years in another company. So there I started as a support engineer. So does anybody know a company called Octopus Deploy? Yeah, so, so I, was a, I was the fourth person hired there um, and I was the support engineer and I came up with a support system for the product. Um, and in that four years, I moved on to being the head of support, but it took quite a while and I was hiring people under me and things didn't go far and then there was nowhere to go from there. There was no room for career progression in management. A lot of small tech companies go on this flat structure, which pretty much just means we can't go anywhere. Like, it's a pretty solid ceiling, not really even a glass ceiling. They've just got nowhere because there's one person running it. But it took about, you know, like it was over a span of four years and it wasn't very fast. What I did during this time was I started speaking. So I started at meetups and then it moved on to, um, on to conferences. First year I think I did one, second year maybe two or three, then it moved on to five. And then we moved on to sort of nine. Nine's a pretty good cap if you've got a full-time job. Um, so that's when I started. And what I was able to do is I was able to use that speaking to get my current job, which was at the time assistant director of DevOps at the ABS. Now, being a DevOps engineer, um, I was able to do quite a few things. But I set myself a goal that I wanted to be acting director or director within about three years. But what happened is it happened in about eight months. So I went back and I started thinking about that, like what made those changes. So we'll start going through what I think was different between my seven and four years to my eight months and why I've made such advancements. I mean, apart from, you know, obvious the experience and years, but I think speaking had quite a lot to do with it. So who are these awesome people that get up in front of you and speak? They're obviously extroverted rock stars, which is absolutely false. Like, there is no truth in that at all. I'm very much introverted. And yeah, I don't trash my hotel rooms and that kind of thing. But a lot of people speaking up here, we're not extroverts. And it's one of those things because I'm speaking at you, not to you. You know, I can sit up here and you're all looking at me and it's very motivating for me to open my mouth and speak. But there's no small talk, so I just get to get to the point, so it's, it's kind of okay with me. And I kind of like to think of myself as having a bit of this makeup um, that, you know, I'm like 10% absolute genius, like that, that's me, and the rest is literally just like smoke and mirrors and you know, I'm standing up here and my stomach's a bit queasy today because of, you know, food poisoning, but sometimes that's nerves. The thing is, you don't necessarily see it because I can keep talking and I can talk okay. Sometimes, except when I see things like talk okay. Um, but <laughs> I'm pretty introverted and I'm not going to go up and talk to people, but I'm super happy to talk to a packed room of people. So there's a lot of that that actually happens. We're not necessarily here and going to go out and have lots of conversations with people, but it's okay to sort of stand up here and talk. This is really common if you start to talk to a lot of tech people, because generally in tech and generally in STEM, we are a little bit introverted, you know, we want to deal with fun problems more than talking to people. So this is pretty correct for a lot of people you know. So what has speaking done for me? One of the things it's done is I just don't panic now when people ask me to sort of give my opinion. Um, how many times have you been in a meeting and you, the agenda's about something, and you're not really paying attention and then someone turns to you and they're like, so what do you think, right? <laughs> right? The worst thing that can happen, you're like, God, what did they even say? And Generally, you know, you were looking at Twitter or somebody sent you a message and it wasn't really that interesting, but now you have to give an opinion. So the difference is that 
I found what I was doing when I joined the ABS is that moment would happen and I hadn't been paying attention. But I would go, you know, it's a really interesting point you've made and I've really appreciated everybody's difference of opinions. I think we can take this offline and have a better conversation, <laughs> right? And then I went, where did that come from and how awesome is that? So I just didn't panic in that moment and I was nice and calm and controlled. And then more people started asking me my opinions and then I started appearing on agendas as having opinions. But it was only because instead of sitting there going, oh, oh no, I don't really have anything to say, like that's very, very good reaction, I found that I was going, all right, cool, I have to say something in one minute. What cool thing can I say? Or how can I divert it and not actually say anything? And that was a skill I learned too. <laughs> Because if you think about it when we're up here, we get asked a lot of questions that we're probably not prepared for. And we have to be able to say, that's a very good point. I don't have the answer right now, but I could either get it to you later or we could have a conversation about it after. And that's a skill you learn. And it works really well in government and leadership. <laughs> so this is another thing, and this is one of those phrases that people aren't really sure about. A lot of people don't like, especially speakers, they don't want to know that they're a thought leader. But I was speaking about DevOps. I was speaking at meetups. I was speaking about conferences. It took a lot of the place out of my resume of having to prove that I could do that thing because I was talking about that thing and I was talking about my experience of that thing. So they started calling me a thought leader and I'm like, look, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take the extra money and that's really cool for me. It's one of those things where I go into meetings sometimes and it'll be somebody new in the organisation and they're like, oh, I was, you know, I did this search for this thing and your name came up and I haven't watched the video yet. And I'm like, it's cool, I think that one was about gardening, you don't really have to watch it. <laughs> but they started to notice my name. So it was something that showed that I had experience in the topic and I was able to present ideas and arguments in a way that people could take in. And that is another thing that I think attributed to me getting into more of a leadership position in a shorter time than I thought. Another thing is you get called a subject matter expert, right? So that's, that's also a nice thing, especially when you deal in a space like statistics, because there are a lot of SMEs around, and then suddenly I am one and people start referring to me. So this gives you pretty much qualifications based on content you've written that people think is really good. And also when you speak, you don't need as many references and you know, there's not really that much peer review. So why don't we speak? And one of the big things and one of the reasons people don't speak is fear. And that is absolutely, you know, it's one of those, it's, it's pretty much the top reason. Um, there are people with full-on phobias who would rather die than speak in public. Then there are, like, that's probably a level, you know, you need to talk about with your therapist more than me. But if you're at the point of it's just a bit scary, we can get past that a little. I implore that all of you, if you don't know about it, look up information on imposter syndrome. I'll talk about it a little, but it's something that needs its own talk, its own time, and it's something that we all deal with, including people who appear to be extroverted rock stars. We all deal with it. Am I qualified to speak here? Have you seen the quality of the speakers at this conference? And then I go, and I'm also speaking, <laughs> right? It happens, imposter syndrome. What we think in that little explosion of yellow is we think that's what we know, and then we think the encompassing part is what everybody else knows. And there's absolutely nothing that we could know that everybody else doesn't already know that an audience, especially if we're talking about a tech thing, that they think everybody in the audience already knows this, why am I going to speak about it? But the fact is, it's actually more like this, where you know a bit and then you have some overlap with everybody else. But there's no encompassing, there's no one in the room who's going to know exactly what you're going to say or what you're talking about. And one of the other things is your experience absolutely matters. I'm up here talking about my experience in my career, which is something that none of you could talk about unless you've been following me around. And please stop following me around, you know. So 
you don't know my experience, you don't know about my journey unless we've talked about it. So my experience and what I've learned from it, I can tell you about and you can take that in, you can decide if it's going to work for you. You can relate it back to your own experience and that's the journey that we have as speakers. We get to relate a story or an experience and you can take in whatever you want. And one of the things about speaking is we just know that you've been here all day, this is one of the last sessions, brain's pretty full, probably a bit tired. You're only going to take one thing away from my talk and I don't know what that is. So as long as you take something away from my talk, it's okay. I'm going to talk about a few things, but maybe, you know, I give you a little bit of an idea about how to speak. Okay, so like I was saying at Smoke and Mirrors, or as I like to say, the bravery to get up here looks a lot like confidence. Just getting up here, standing straight, looking at all of your amazing faces and speaking looks really confident, no matter how nervous you are. I run workshops and I actually have a couple of the students in now and all of them um, in my last workshop we did lightning talks and they were all told that they were so confident and they were really prepared. All of them were shaking, like one person was literally shaking. But she stood up there and she spoke and she's like, you're right, you know, just like the act of standing up there showed that I had the confidence to get up there and people thought I was really confident and knew what I was talking about, but it was just the bravery of speaking. So bravery is a really, really big part of getting up here. And that's what you want to do. Just be brave and stand up here. And you're going to look really confident, especially if you keep speaking. So I get asked, what, what do we talk about? This is sort of the second problem where... I don't know what to talk about, everything's been said. Now, that's a really, really big fallacy. I worked, when I worked for Octopus, all of the customers were on the bleeding edge of technology. They were all using the best DevOps practices, they were all really new, and I sort of left Octopus and I'm like, there's nothing I can sort of say about DevOps that no one already knows, and I was really wrong. It turned out that, you know, people didn't, even deploy automatically and do some, you know, really cool nifty development practices and we're using very, very old version control. And what it showed me was you can still speak to anybody at a beginner level. Maybe they're starting on their journey or maybe they're a student, maybe they're new to the industry, maybe they're transitioning into the industry. So the things that I sort of mention are if you're asked about something a lot, that's probably a really good talk. Because if you're being asked about it, other people want to know about it and it's piquing enough interest. And if it's something you can answer, you can do a lightning talk, you can do a meetup talk, you can do a conference talk. But if it's something people are asking about, that's what you want to talk about. And the second thing is just, what do you know? And this was another experience which I think helped my career at the ABS. I get this call in the morning and it was about three months in and the guy's like, hey, I need a favour. I'm like, yeah. And he said, can you, like, give us a talk about Octopus on our group meeting? Like, somebody's fallen through. And I'm like, sure. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah. He's like, it's in two hours. And I'm like, all right, cool. He's like, okay. And I said, so how long do you want me to speak for? And he says, oh, about 10 minutes. And I'm like, oh, really? All right? Because I can talk about it forever. Like, put me in a room and I'll talk about it forever. Um, and I ended up joining the call and talking for 45 minutes like with two hours notice. And it showed the entire team that I could do really nice favours for people. I could talk about a subject. It was something I knew fairly intimately. They threw questions at me. I could answer them. I gave them a small demonstration. They were like, I was like, oh, sorry, I took up so much time. They're like, can you come back later? So if you know about it, you can talk about it. But it also means that you should probably say yes if somebody asks you to talk about it because it gives you that knowledge like it gives you, makes people think you're a thought leader. Anything you're passionate about means you're going to get up here and you're going to speak really well. And people think, well, we're in the tech space, that means I have to speak about something tech. So I've spoken about World of Warcraft, um, gardening, speaking, as well as all the DevOpsy type stuff I do. And so I have that gardening picture. I did a talk about aquaponics because people kept asking me about it at conferences. 
So all of those things lead to like experience. If you can talk about your experience, people learn from it. And these are all engaging talks. And if you think about any talks that you've liked or you've heard, have they been somebody's passion, something they know a lot about their own experience, and is that what's made it engaging? And generally, the answer is yes. A lot of the time, when you're asked, even me, if I'm asked to talk about something that I'm not really super engaged and I don't know a lot about, it's not an engaging talk for my audience either. You have to put a lot more effort into it if you don't follow those things. So that is what you need to pick when you're deciding what to talk about. Does somebody ask you, what's your passion? You can find a space to talk about these things. I want to talk a little bit about representation at conferences. In Brisbane, who's from Brisbane? Yay, Brisbane. Um, so in Brisbane, we have the DDD conference. It's run in Sydney as well, Perth, Melbourne, starting in Adelaide. Anyone from Adelaide, look up DDD. Um, and in Brisbane, I've so far spoken three years in a row, bowing out with my hat trick this year. But it's a voted for conference. It's a conference run by volunteers um, in the sort of tech space. And people vote for what sessions they want. So in 2017, there were three submissions out of the hundred or so, a couple of hundred or so submissions that were by women. And out of that, they ended up with two speakers, but one was an invited keynote. And the total speakers they have there is 17. In 2018, we decided to kick up a little bit of, you know, fun um, and, and formed a little, little gang where we spoke about DDD a lot everywhere and we upped the submission rate. So we ended up upping, there ended up being 14 submissions. Now the miraculous thing that happened was that we ended up with seven women speakers. So we went from two out of 17 to seven out of 17 speakers that were women at this tiny little conference just by more submissions and speaking about the conference. There is a website called xxtechconfspeakers.org that records the number of um, conferences that have women who attend. And this graph represents the number of, the percentage of attendance, like, I mean, stats are obviously a hat to show, like, data representation and stats. But, um, the size of the dot is how many speakers are in the dot, and then the percentage is how many women or non-binary um, speakers there are. So if you can see, pretty much under 50%, there's no really good gender representation when it comes to the larger speakers. The smaller, the smaller conferences have a bit more of a chance, but at the moment, it's not great, and the ones right down the bottom were like, 10 to zero, so then it kind of goes up a bit. The larger ones do have a problem with submissions, so we'll talk about that a little bit. So it was 117 conferences tracked, and then in the total there were um, 3,437 speakers, which averaged out to 33% um, non-male representation, but that was based on the percentage for everything. So I went a bit deeper and there ended up being like 886 women on non-binary, which is actually only 25% of the speakers in 117 conferences in Australia tracked were non-men. So it's a problem that we have. And one of the things, and I see a few faces in the audience, there are women speakers who pretty much burn out because we want to be there and we want to speak, but there's only so many like conferences we can get to. We end up getting asked a lot because if you're a good speaker and engaging, you get asked to go back. But there's only so many can do. So you'll find that there are women who will speak at conferences for a year and then they'll disappear for a couple of years. And that's just because it's just, it's a lot of effort going, speaking, pre preparing talks, they take time. So really want to say is you can do it, but also that we need you and that we want more women to speak and we want them to represent our entire diversity of women and not just this one idea of what a woman is. And that you can get up here and speak, you can be nerdy and you can stumble and you can do all of those things. We don't have to be perfect. We can present when we've got food poisoning, it's okay, we can do it. 
Um, so really, we need to submit everywhere. And the more submissions there are, the more chances we have to change that. And that's something to consider. But also what you can do is you can give back to your community. So in Brisbane, we have a very, very strong meetup community. Does anybody, any of the other places, any of the other states, Melbourne, I think, has a very good one. Sydney has a good one. So give back to your community. Start small. Start at meetups. Um, everybody seen Bring It On? All right? I know I'm old. I'm sorry. So there's a bit where she says, you know, football games are our practice. Meetups are my practice, right? Meetups are a really great place. Meetups aren't expecting a polished conference talk. They're just expecting people to get out there and speak. But what it does is it gives you that practice in what you're doing. So I suggest that you always submit to meetups. In Brisbane, we have fantastic meetups that I would recommend. So we have Women Who Code, we have Tech Newbies, we have Brisbane Data Science, we have BrizJS. We the list is like this big and you should speak at all of them. And they want you to speak. Like they're always looking for speakers. Even if they have it planned out, it doesn't matter because the time can, you know, people can drop out, that kind of thing. But it's good for you. And just remember that you do speak every day in your jobs. You're in meetings, you are being asked to give presentations, you are just talking to somebody who might be senior than you. And having the practice to speak in front of people and know what to say and not stumble is something that is really, really very good for your career. And I also just want to say that we should support the crap out of each other because we need to make sure that we're here for each other and that we're speaking. Very, very quickly, be careful with shoes. Um, so I have some nice heels on today. Floors like this have big spaces and you can fall into them. All right. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for our amazing speaker. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, sorry we don't have much time for the question and answer, but please feel free to um, reach out to Vanessa. She'll be here in a few minutes um, for if you have any questions. Hello again. Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to our session for this after afternoon entitled Male Bias and Problematic Gender Stereotypes in a Smart Home. Um, so we have our amazing speaker for this afternoon to tell us, ab tell us about the topic. But before that, let's have some house rules. Um, so the exit door, just in case of emergency, is at the left side of our room. And just uh, please make your phone in silent mode or turn it off just to not to interrupt our speaker. And then if you have any questions, we have five minutes after the speaker's presentations, so feel free to ask questions after her. And then um, allow me to introduce our lovely speaker for this afternoon. So we have Yolanda Strangers, um, is a digital sociologist and scholar of emerging technologies, particularly in home. She holds the position of Associate Professor of Digital Technology and Society in the Emerging Technologies Love It in the Faculty of IT in Monash University. Please help me welcome Yolanda. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. And it's so nice to see a room full of friendly, lovely women, mainly. <laughs> it's an unusual experience. I'm going to be talking today about the uh, research that I've been doing with my colleague Jenny Kennedy from the Digital Ethnography Research Centre at RMIT University on this issue of male bias and problematic gender stereotypes in the smart home. This isn't exactly a research talk, but it does draw on our research. More what I wanted to do today was share uh, our story and my story of how we came to this topic, some of the problems and the issues that we're now seeing in relation to male bias in relation to the smart home, and then some suggestions that we've been working on about how we actually go about changing this, which we're interested to hear your thoughts and, and um, views on. So a little bit about me. I actually, uh, as, um, as was mentioned, I'm a, a digital sociologist uh, and I have a very bad case often of imposter syndrome in the IT sector. Uh, because I've come from the social sciences rather than the technology disciplines. And my experience has been in understanding how people use emerging technologies in their homes, particularly in relation to energy. So I started out my career looking at smart metering, looking at things like uh, eco-feedback and energy systems, looking at how people use solar panels and different types of energy technologies in relation to their home, and, and wondering and, and, and questioning whether or not these kinds of devices actually help us save energy and shift energy, working with energy sector stakeholders. 
And I employ something that's called digital ethnography in my research where we go in and really seek to understand people's own experiences with these technologies and how they're incorporating different types of devices into their lives. So what became very apparent to me in this energy space, which at the time I had no interest in gender whatsoever, but what became very apparent to me very quickly was that gender actually had everything to do with energy technologies in the home. And the reason this became apparent was because actually what consumes energy in the home and what actually uses energy are the everyday activities that we engage in, things like laundering, showering, heating and cooling. And those are activities that are still mostly done by women in the home or women are in, in charge or directing in some way how those activities are done. And yet what we were seeing was these energy technologies coming into a home that were much more of interest to men. So there was this disparity between the types of devices that were intended to engage us in energy and reduce our consumption and the actual places in which consumption takes place with men being interested in the energy stuff, the geeky kind of technology, and women more likely to be interested in, in these, these activities. So what did I do about this? Well, um, I invented this guy. His name is Resource Man. <laughs> this is an, a graphic that was created by the uh, magazine Interactions, a feature article I did about Resource Man a number of years ago now, and he was really an intervention into this space. It was kind of like a way of showcasing the bias that was coming primarily from uh, male engineers in the energy sector and the projection they were making that you know, in order to manage our energy effectively in homes, we all have to become engineers. We all have to use technologies and data in a really rational kind of um, way. Uh, and that's exactly what I, I said the imagined energy consumer, the ideal energy consumer that the en energy sector want, wanted had, had created. So Resource Man uh, is imagined in the image of energy engineers who, who dominate in this space. And I presented him to all you know, male audiences several times, all audiences of engineers. And it was great because they kind of realised you know, in a kind of humorous way that they were projecting their own bias onto homes and expecting people to behave in this way. And that really led me to, to a discussion about the other ways people consume energy, the things that are actually important to them like comfort, convenience and health and how we actually can shape and change energy around those. Those, those issues. So jump forward a little bit. So that's not moving. It's moving on my slides, but yeah, thank you. Um, so a few years after my work on energy, I started getting into the smart home space and I became interested in devices like digital home voice assistants, like Google Home and Alexa, which I'm sure you've all heard of. I became interested in Robovax and a range of other kind of automated technologies that you know control the lights and, and monitor people in the home and, and, and you know can lock doors and various kinds of devices that were coming in. And again, I had a fellowship, I had a research project that was investigating whether or not these devices saved energy and, and contributed to sustainability, because again, that was still my core interest. And Sillily, of course, had kind of not thought to consider um, gender, which is, you know, you think I would have learnt, but no, I didn't. So um, what then became apparent was that gender was actually really critical in this, in this area and that, in fact, um, these devices have a number of, of gendered effects. For a start, what we were finding is that the people who are more likely to be interested in bringing these devices into their home are again men, and that's what we, we found in the research that we were doing. But also, there's a feminisation of devices themselves here. Not only in voice that we can see in things like digital voice assistants like Google Home and Alexa, but also in the types of roles some of these technologies were intended to perform in the home, which is to do traditional uh, feminised household chores. And that's when I met up with my colleague Jenny at RMIT. She was also doing related ethnographic work on the networked home. And we came together with this, this common interest uh, in gender in the home and the way that it was, it was creating some really interesting effects and problems in the homes that we, we were visiting in Australia. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time kind of going over the background of this issue. It has been extensively kind of trawled over particularly recently uh, and I'm imagining that um, you know it's quite familiar to everyone in this audience because we've been talking about it the last two days that there is you know a domination of men uh, designing these types of IT systems and that's the bias is actually more pronounced as you get into advanced and what are considered pioneering technologies like AI and machine learning which definitely applies to the devices that are in the smart home space. And I just wanted to also draw your attention to this report that came out this year from UNESCO Equal Skills Coalition. Apologies, the image is just cut off the bottom here. 
Uh, and they really also draw attention to this, this issue and, and the issue being that the, uh, the bias that is evident in the design and programming of devices is actually also creating problems in the types of things that we're, we're actually designing. Uh, so they produced this report called I'd Blush If I Could. It's actually a reference to uh, a phrase that Siri previously said that's now been changed. But essentially if you made some sort of sexual solicitation towards Siri, she would respond with I'd blush if I could. So a kind of problematic response to a, um, a sexual, you know, inappropriate sexual uh, uh, elicitation towards this, this device. And in this report, they actually extend, they show quite clearly that there is a link between who's designing these technologies and the types of responses and the kinds of ways that they act and um, yeah, respond to us in everyday life. So this is also something that we've explored in other ways in our research and, and one of the things we're concerned about is that this bias also reflects kind of not only what kinds of technologies get designed but then who might actually be interested in devices as well. So we found through um, analysis of smart home marketing materials, so we've done content analysis of advertising and also articles written about the smart home, that these devices are more likely to be marketed towards men uh, and to reflect typical or stereotypical masculine interests, particularly in entertainment devices like audiovisual equipment or in smart home uh, security systems. And another kind of, kind of interesting way in which these devices are often marketed is as a type of wife replacement or as a type of um, device which can take up some of the responsibilities that traditionally fell to the wife in the home which many contemporary societies no longer have, you know, the housewife I mean, no longer have um, access to. And so this is again uh, ma often marketed towards men as a way that they kind of alleviate their responsibilities to maybe step up in regards to domestic responsibilities in the home and to contribute by bringing these technologies in and using them to, um, to, to do various chores and various um, activities in the home without actually necessarily taking on more responsibility themselves. And therefore, the argument being that that will free up their leisure time uh, for other things. So one of the problems though with with this and with the, with the appeal to men and then, and then the follow on being that we find that men are the ones often instigating and bringing the technology into the home, is it has some unforeseen effects and unforeseen outcomes. So one of those is that it may actually lead to something that's called digital housekeeping or an increase in digital housekeeping in the home. This is something that's been wide, widely uh, studied. Uh, it was um, brought into kind of terminology a number of years ago by someone called Peter Tolmy and his colleagues and it refers to the work or the labour that's involved in taking care of all the tech in the home. So think about, you know, updating apps, making sure things talk to each other, integrating technologies, purchasing, researching, uh, just even tidying cables and making sure it all works. And uh, what we find in our research is that it's, again, often men who actually are taking on this role and this extra labour in the home without that necessarily being something that's pre-negotiated or thought about, and certainly not currently in, um, in the kind of arena of public attention. So, for example, we currently collect ABS stats on just regular housework or traditional housework tasks, but we're not really keeping a track of the increase in digital housekeeping and the effects that that might actually be having on other gendered um, breakdown of labour in the home. So one of the things that we notice is that when men are more engaged in this type of labour in the home, uh, and it is, uh, well, it, it's, there's a debate as well about whether it's actually labour or some, some people actually refer to it as a type of leisure activity or fun. So it, it can kind of flip between those two things, you know, at times it might be an engaging fun thing to do for the people who are engaged in this, but other times it can actually be, you know, quite burdensome and, and quite a chore. But one of the effects it's having on the overall labour of the home is that it, it takes uh, this person's away, time away, and, and as I said, typically that's a man, away from other more traditional household chores, like for example, you know, parenting children or cooking dinner or doing some of those activities. So this is also kind of shaping and changing the digital, uh, sorry, the, the gender breakdown of, of labour in the home in ways that affect both men and women. Another area of concern which has actually been widely discussed by scholars and commentators in this area are the types of stereotypes that are promoted by feminised technology in the home. And this is something that's, that's raised by the UNESCO report I put up earlier and discussed there in, in quite a lot of detail as well. 
So as I said, technology can be gendered by um, voice and design, but also by its personality. And, and really the main critique that's been levelled at digital voice assistants in particular, but also a range of other smart home technologies, is that they adopt a subservient role, uh, that they, they perpetuate stereotypes of a female or feminised character taking back up the responsibilities of the home and doing that in a very docile and um, submissive and very compliant kind of way, embodying the ideals of, say, a 1950s housewife. So that is something that we're concerned about and many other scholars are concerned about as well because we have this super advanced technology really kind of coming into our homes in, in large numbers, reinforcing or taking us back to some of these, you know, subservient ideas of where a, wom a woman's role might be. She looks even more scary up there than <laughs> she did when I was putting these slides together. Uh, there's also a really interesting story here about what happens when this technology goes wrong, which invariably happens with any new or emerging technology that comes into our home, and the problems that are particularly associated with a technology that goes wrong that's been feminised, as, as is the case with some of these devices. So when these devices break down, when Alexa stops working or, or Google Home or whatever, and, and they have a female voice, we don't blame the technology or the designers, we actually blame women. And we associate the technology again with sort of um, these quite um, old fashioned and, and, and old uh, ideas of female ditziness or stupidity, of, um, of them being some sort of kind of hysterical or demonic character, which, which are very, as I said, that there's long held associations between females and uh, women and, and those kinds of ideas throughout history that we can, we can see that kind of link coming through here. But the other way in which these ideas are now again being promoted and where we see them quite often is actually on screen. So if we look at representations of artificial women or digital women that we see in sci-fi movies, they often uh, represent or characterise this trope of a woman that is um, both beautiful and, and perfect in many ways, often represented as a, as a white, you know, a young woman, but somehow goes wrong, you know, that the technology some, somehow um, doesn't work as intended and this, this woman on our screens has a glitch or has some sort of um, uh, plot line that takes her into a very dangerous character sort of representation. So the movies I'm thinking of here, which you probably know, are things like Weird Science, Stepford Wives, Ex Machina, Cherry 2000, Blade Runner 2050, there's a whole host of them. Uh, and they all kind of represent this type of woman. So it's, it's unsurprising then that we, when we see, you know, digital women in our homes and um, in our lives that we also kind of draw on those tropes from popular fiction and from sci-fi to help explain those, those situations. So there's a couple of examples I just want to quickly give you in relation to that. Um, there was um, a, uh, an incident at the 2018 uh, Consumer Electronics Show uh, last year where the um, marketing chief of LG uh, had uh, the, the LG's new assistant on stage, her, her name was Chloe, and she just wouldn't talk to him. And this got widely reported in the media as her giving him the silent treatment and as um, uh, having, having a bad day. So these kinds of phrases getting used um, to represent, you know, Chloe's malfunction on stage and Chloe herself being deemed responsible or deemed to having some sort of personality flaw as opposed to the people who may have designed her. And likewise, you might have heard of a story about Alexa uh, uh, last year having a kind of creepy laugh that was, this is again widely reported, but widely reported as um, not as a glitch in the system, which is actually what it was, but as Alexa being hysterical, as Alexa being um, out of control. So you can see how these tropes kind of get circulated through society. Research also shows that people are more likely to abuse and sexually harass robots when they have a female form. And again, these, act again, these actions reinforce these negative stereotypes towards women. And until fairly recently, this has started to shift and started to change through criticism from a number of commentators and scholars. But until recently, they actually responded quite positively to abuse directed towards them, like that example that was on the UNESCO report of Siri saying, well, I'd, I'd blush if I could if she was um, asked to have sex or do other, some kind of other activity. Uh, but it's still quite rare for a device or a robot, robot to actually shut itself down in response to abuse or actually to just refuse to engage with somebody that's treating it in a disrespectful way. 
And finally, kind of at the more sinister end of the spectrum, there are problems on the home front when we have, you know, one particular group of people, in this case, as I've said, it's more likely to be men bringing technology into the home and knowing how to use it. So there's problems when we have one group of people who are um, more interested in setting up and maintaining technologies. And it, there's some emerging and disturbing research now that's coming out um, from around the world that shows that in situations of domestic violence, uh, these technologies can be used to lock people in or out of a home and also monitor them with, with or without their consent. And this, this occurs because we have one group of people who are more likely, as I said, to, to know how to um, set up and, and use and, uh, these technologies and are bringing them into the home. Okay, so I just want to move into now some, some suggestions quickly about how we're approaching this issue and, and some ideas we have for how we might respond to these set of quite complex and diverse issues. So the first is, you know, something that we've been talking increasingly about or constantly about at this conference, which is about how we involve more women in technology. And there's a number of fantastic organisations out there, I've just put one up, Code Like a Girl, that are actually, you know, really investing time and energy into this, as I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, so great, that's great, and I think more of that is fantastic. But what we also need to be doing is thinking about how we involve other disciplines, and in particular I think the social sciences, welcoming the social sciences into technology disciplines. So we need to be thinking about how technology is, and, and um, technology is not just information science, but is actually social science. This is a really great example, I think, of how technology actually creates and drives social change. So for me, you know, it's kind of a logical extension of that, that we would involve the people who are experts in social science in thinking about how we go about solving and these problems and, and designing something different. So that's, that's kind of one thing that we're thinking about um, in this space. And that's starting to happen in, in some organisations that are hiring more social sciences, scientists into technology, but it's, it's still a very kind of slow, slow process at the moment. Uh, another suggestion which is inspired by the Gina Davies Institute on gender in media uh, called cjane.org, Jane, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it's quite a popular campaign and it's called If She Can See It, She Can Be It. And the idea is that if we can see uh, role models, um, you know, positive role models for women, if we just see women on screen and girls on screen, then that will encourage real, <laughs> real life girls and women to actually want to become and be the, the things that they see on screen. So we're concerned here, not just about women and, and girls on screen, but about the types of artificial women and digital women that we're seeing on screen. So there's a conversation here to have with the sci-fi community, which is incidentally another field that's dominated by men again, who are thinking about and designing these types of women we're seeing on our screen, to actually think about how we can create and design and imagine different types of artificial women that go onto our screens and then go on to inform how we think about what what a digital woman might look like, but also actually directly go on to inform the design of robots and various types of digital systems that are coming into our lives and our homes. Another one of our suggestions is about um, combating the everyday sexism that's directed towards AI, uh, particularly female AI. So there's, uh, you would probably have heard of Laura Bates, uh, Bates's really successful campaign in this area called Everyday Sexism, which is kind of related to the Me Too movement. And it's really um, a project that was designed to call out the kind of everyday acts of sexism that are directed towards women in our society. And one of our suggestions here is to extend that to uh, feminised uh, assistance and to robots and AI in the home and make sure that we as a society both call out the sexism that's directed towards this technology because we know that it has a direct effect on us and on how we think about women, but also for the AI itself and for the digital assistants themselves to call out the, the, the sexism that's directed at them and not be complicit or complacent in, in, that, um, in that abuse. There are a number of research teams around the world that are now working on how we build a feminist assistant. Uh, so Alexa and Siri actually already claim they are feminists. I think that that's not true. Uh, they claim that because they say they support equality, but they're still very much in a subservient role in the home and it takes much more than what they're currently doing to be a feminist, I would, I would say. So there's calls for gender neutral assistance and many devices now already offer male voices. So there's been some progress in that regard, but we still need to also think about that subservient role and what a device that is, uh, has respect for itself and demands respect of others might actually, what it might actually look like. I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna skip through here quickly. 
Another approach that's been explored by researchers and entrepreneurs like Jacqueline Fieldman is not just to go gender neutral, but to think about these devices you know, outside the spectrum of gender altogether and actually try and design devices that have a bot personality, distinctive from a human personality. So Feldman actually developed a um, genderless chatbot called Kai for the banking sector, and that was designed with the principles of dignity and respect. And if you ask it a question about you know, anything to do with its humanness, it will actually just remind you that it's a robot and it will talk to you about its algorithms and its processes uh, in a very friendly way, but it will, it will not try and pretend that it is a human or any type of, you know, part of any sort of construct of gender. So that's another really interesting and possibly productive way of responding to this. And finally, um, another angle to explore here, which ourselves and other researchers are pursuing, is how we actually think about smart, how smart home devices can be made to allow for a much more diverse expression of gender and genders. I've been speaking in a fairly heteronormative, heterosexual kind of way here, but there is more than just women and, and, and men to consider. There are non-binary genders as well. Uh, and there are a number, as I said, a number of researchers in the, particularly the human computer interaction design community, thinking about um, these issues and how we design, for example, for something that um, Jennifer Road calls technical femininity. But the problem here, I think, is it's really tricky to think about how do we design, design devices that are better for women without kind of falling back into stereotypical traps? How do we design for diversity? How do we design for like broadness of spectrums of different gender expressions and different identity expressions that don't just kind of bring us back to the familiar stereotypes? And that's an ongoing challenge for this research area. So this kind of brings me to the end of the talk and, you know, what's gender got to do with it or what's gender got to do with IT. I think this is a, just an example that shows that it's, you know, got a lot to do with it. That right from the beginning of, you know, who's designing, thinking about these technologies, what kinds of ideas they promote and market, who's actually adopting them and incorporating to their homes, and then the, the effects and the consequences of that uh, through to, you know, what we might be able to do differently. I think this is a really great case study and example of the importance of the work uh, that we all do and of the kinds of ideas that these kind, you know, thinking of through these issues uh, can gener generate. So hopefully that's given you some some thoughts and some inspiration for your own work. Thank you. Thank you so much to our speaker. Please accept our simple token of appreciation. Thank you. Yes. Um, we can still entertain a few questions, like one or two, if you have any questions yet. Uh, we have a microphone in the middle. Hi, uh, my name is Pauline Pounds. I'm a robotics developer at University of Queensland. Uh, and as a transgender woman and also a developer of social robots, I have to say it's really hard to actually build a robot without gender. Humans will gender things at the drop of a hat. It's really challenging. Um, I just had a query for you. When you talk about the subservience of digital assistants, uh, is, is the issue that the digital assistants are subservient or is the problem that they're being feminine gendered because HAL 9000 was male gendered and soft spoken and killed the crew? I would rather have a subservient system without gender. It, what, what's your thoughts on that? Jack, Jacqueline Feldman's um, genderless spot provides a really nice example there because I mean, yeah, I guess abuse can be directed towards both male and, and female robots. And her approach is that no device should be, um, you know, subservient. It doesn't mean that it has to be rude to us. It doesn't mean that it can't be there to serve us. But the role then becomes more about collaboration and interaction with people rather than the role being, you know, to serve or to um, simply be there, you know, for our, for our beck and call. So I think that there are ways of dealing with that in quite a, a nuanced way. At the moment, the debate seems to be either, um, you know, they're going to be uh, argumentative and nasty to be around and kind of bossy, or they're going to be, you know, completely compliant and, um, you know, subservient. And I think there's, there's um, some interesting examples where we can find a middle ground that actually will, you know, regardless of gender, regardless of whether they're even considered human will bring us all towards a, a more mutually respectful approach. So there's a philosophical question there about what should be our relationship with technology because when I hit the light switch I don't want to discuss with the light switch I want it to mm. turn on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so just something I thought I'd raise. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Now we can entertain one more. There's more questions. No questions? 
Thank you so much to our beloved speakers. Let's give him a round of applause again.